Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. The name of this class is Demystifying the Black Box. This is a modern look on DSP. The goals of this class is dual purpose. One, if you already have a grasp for DSP, this will help you sell it to your customers by making it easier for them to understand. Now, for those who aren't selling DSP, this might make it easier for you to talk to your friends about DSP, convince them that their car sounds bad and they should have a DSP. And just make it not so scary. I feel like people are scared of it for some reason. I know, you think this is Halloween. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Got me. Uh, if you are, and there again, two, if you are apprehensive at all about installing DSP, by the end, you will be more comfortable with it. They'll be all warm and fuzzy. Yeah, they'll, they'll feel like they're a pro. Okay, let's not go that yeah, far. Yeah, I know. <laughs> At the core of every DSP is several products we have been using in car audio for years. Now some of you OGs out there will immediately go, wait a minute, hold on, I haven't thought of it like this. <laughs> and the question is, but why haven't you? First and foremost, pretty much every DSP on the market has some form of high level as well as low level integration. But it's that high level integration that, you know, kind of sets it apart from just your standard high level to low level yeah. adapter. Uh, we'll be talking about that. Equalization. <laughs> there again, a DSP at its core is an EQ. There's a mystery box, as in everything. And this feature, of course, is one of those features that is. I feel the scarier part, which is yeah. one of the more easier parts. Agreed. And then lastly, it has a crossover. Wait a minute. We've been using crossovers in car audio since pretty, pretty much, much the beginning of, cro of uh, yeah. car audio. Yeah. Uh, or audio yeah. in general, for that matter. <laughs> That's like, you, true. You really yep. can't do anything without yep. a crossover. So every DSP, as we've talked about, is made out of these four things. Even though there's a question mark, it's still a very important one. The DSP has made it convenient by putting all of them into one box. Unfortunately, by doing this, it has also made it a bit of a mystery. Breaking it down into these core parts, we can see it is quite an amazing and helpful tool. Let's begin. I know, I try to make this easy for myself. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, you know, wrote yourself a script. I wrote myself a script. Uh, integration. As we just talked about, integration into the factory radio is definitely nothing new to anyone here. Most of the time, we grab a high-level to low-level converter and tap it into the speakers of the car. Now, depending on the type of high-level to low-level, or LOC, line output converter you use, you're going to have varying results, meaning some are gonna sound good and some aren't gonna sound good at all, and some could possibly do damage to your car just by the way they're built, meaning they can't handle proper voltage, they're made out of just load resistors yep. that, so. Just cheap garbage wrapped in plastic. Some of them are represented on the, the image here. <laughs> and then of course there are better high level to low level adapters, mm -hmm. and the results may vary, you got it. As nice as we make this, there are still shortcomings. Does an LOC choose to have, or geez, does the LOC you choose have de-equalization? Meaning does it have the ability to correct that factory signal? Yeah, 99% of the time, no. Correct. <laughs> well, of course, why did I say correct? Right. You know that, I yeah. wouldn't have wrote it if it wasn't correct. <laughs> A matrix line driver. Really cool feature. Very cool, yeah or any adjustment at all other than hopefully a gain adjustment. And even then, some of them don't even have that. No, let's just put it on and go. <laughs> the first and most basic feature of a DSP is the line output converter, plus channel routing of all channels. When you grab just a basic line output converter or multiple line output converters, it's an input, it's an output. There's no summing being done. There's no, hey, I need channel one and two to go to three and four, five and six, seven and eight. That doesn't happen with your basic line output converter. Right. Uh, ours has auto equalization, meaning it can look at that factory signal. We can play pink noise. We can hit auto and it'll correct the signal and, and set it to uh, our house curve. Uh, a matrix line driver. 
or a line driver at all, but ours, of course, has a matrix line driver into it, which is a standalone box as well. Yep. Built-in input RTA or real-time analyzer, meaning when we hook our DSP up to something, we can see what signal is coming into it so we can have an idea of, is this a tweeter signal? Is this a mid-range signal? Is there some kind of a base roll-off happening here? Right. And Easily one of the most critical parts of the whole product, in uh, my mind. But ag Agreed. Yeah. yeah. Input gain control. What source is coming into this? Is it a 10 volt source? Is it a 20 volt source? Is it a 16 volt source? Is it a two volt source? The ability to control that input so we can then control our output is very important. Not only that, but that's something that uh, you think about like the last thing we're talking about, the LOCs and how many of them can't handle half of the voltages you were talking about. Yes. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there again, not only do you have output level control, you have independent level control for all channels. If you want channel one louder than channel two and they're both tweeters, you can do that with a DSP. An easily controlled channel summing, bringing those channels together. Again, one of those scary topics, summing, ooh. Which we're gonna demo for <laughs> you. And before we demo, let's take a closer look using the Fernando cam of the inputs, what we were just talking about. So when looking at the DSP, as you can see here, the Phoenix connectors are our inputs. Those are our high level, and they will take how much voltage in? Up to 40 volts. There you go. Yep. 40 volts of input. Then next to that is going to be our RCA inputs. This is the DM608, so we also have a Toshlink input and a digital coax input. So you have multiple ways to get your signal into this processor. And uh, along with those multiple ways, we have multiple ways to bring those together and move those out through the eight channels of output. Let's take a look at the actual software itself. So when we take a look at the input side of this, you know, I mean, on the DM608, the DM Smart DSP software is what we're looking at. That's what we're working with with this piece in particular. And pretty much all the D series products from Audio Controls share that same software, which makes it easy. But in this case, you know, talking about breaking down DSP and making it simple, um, let's take a look at some of the things that we talked about there and kind of how that works via software. Everybody knows, you know, what those things are when you're talking about a standalone LOC and an EQ and this and that. But when we take a look at something as simple as our input signal. So if we have signal coming in on inputs one and two, the first thing that you'll notice in our software is that there's this great built-in RTA. So we can take a look and see exactly what that signal looks like on each of our individual inputs up here. And we can slow down the speed too. Absolutely, so if this is kind of sporadic and hard to see, we have fast, medium, and slow right here. So let's kick, click on slow, slow that down a little bit, and we can get a pretty good look at this. Now, if for whatever reason we couldn't see this very well on the screen too, or it's running off the screen, we can also adjust our sensitivity there. So if I'm not getting hardly anything and I go, uh-oh, where's my signal? I can just adjust this input sensitivity and now I've got a good look at what I've got going on. So, you know, one of the first things I notice when looking at incoming signal is I try to take a look at what does that signal look like? A, do I have full range? Do I not have full range? For those of you that don't know what that would look like, what's full range, what is that? If we've got signal all the way across this RTA, we've got full range signal in one way or the other. So, you know, again, for those that aren't familiar with this, uh, bass and low frequencies is gonna be over here on the left side, mid range in the middle, and high frequencies on the right side in a super uh, layman's side yeah. of things, right? But just yeah. to give an idea. So if we didn't see any info on the left hand side of this screen, but we're about to put in a subwoofer, we're gonna know, okay, the signal we grab doesn't have any bass in it. We're not gonna be able to use that. But one of the other cool things we can do is look at these different inputs quickly and see the difference between them. So in this case, we're taking a look at inputs one, two, and what's nice is we can name those. So uh, let's say inputs one, two is the signal from my front uh, what do we say, front dash speakers or something like that. Sure. <laughs> go wild. Yeah, front dash. And then if we go to our channel three input, we notice we have a hotter signal on channel three. So 
again, we'd be able to instantly take a look at that and go, okay, there's a difference between these two and kind of know what to do with them or at least know we're going to have to do something with them. So that could have, we might have tapped the factory subwoofer. Exactly. So let's or say... front mid base. Yeah, I was going to say front mid base. So let's say front mid. And in this case, we don't have uh, as much signal or any signal on input 4 or input 5, 6. So if this was in a vehicle and I'm taking a look at this and I have inputs run to all of these, but yeah. I look at my RTA and I have nothing, it's also awesome for that troubleshooting side of it to just go, oh no, I have no signal, what's <laughs> going on, right? So it's super handy for stuff like that. So just on that input side, there's some quick, easy things we can see just at a glance to know kind of what we're gonna be working with. Then we also have the input gain control there as well. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned earlier we have the ability to independently control all of our input levels and input gains, and this is exactly where we're going to do that. So it comes defaulted at 0 dB as just kind of a default starting point, basically. Um, but you'll see what happens to the signal in the RTA as well. So if I bring this down, we can see in real time how that signal dropped down as I did that. And same thing if I bring that signal up. So we can take a pretty uh, quick, easy look at what we have going on here. And I normally start with things at zero as well until I get things kind of figured out as I'm going through the system. I like to start with the signal at either negative three or negative six. It's a trick that our friend of the show, Jeff Smith, talked about because that gives us the ability uh, especially on a DSP amplifier where sure. it's all built in. On, a, on an outboard processor like this, eh, zero is probably okay. Mm -hmm. But on an amplifier specifically, starting yeah. at those lower settings gives me more ability to get a little bit... If I need more at the end, I right. can then pull that out. I do negative six when we talk our D-series amplifier. So there yeah, we same, go. same idea. Same idea. So one other thing that some of you guys out there might be noticing when you're looking at the software um, is when we're on input one and two, we also have a feature in there uh, which is the milk or clip light. So this does have an indicator built in on the software side to try to help users set it up and get the most out of their factory head unit or factory system as well. Now, is that the same thing as having an oscilloscope or a tool like that? Absolutely not, but it's a good dummy light if you don't have those other tools. Yeah, so I mean, if you're using a factory radio, mm -hmm. doing the three quarter volume right, uh, and start adjusting your, your input gain to get it to where that light has started to come on, uh, that's as good a point as any, especially when Absolutely. you're using a factory radio. You know, you've hopefully listened to it before you've put the DSP in and you've kind of figured out where it's where it's dying at. Exactly. And that's as loud as you're gonna to want to play it anyways. For so sure. When you're setting that up, it makes it real easy. Yeah. Or now, makes it easier. One of the things that I'll just mention briefly too as we're working through here is um, some of you guys out there watching this are looking at the software and you're like, wait, what's this delay I see on the screen? Now, this is on the input side of things and this is an input uh, delay or time correction. And I'm just gonna briefly say that for 99.9% .9 of the users out there, we don't touch it, we don't recommend it, just, just leave it alone. Um, but I don't want people to get confused and think that that's where yes. they're gonna do their time correction. No, so, it is not. Yeah, so let's, let's just uh, mention that as we move through so um, so we just want to look at input view before we move on yeah I think we've got that yep. so let's rename input view so one and two let's call input one and two where you have let's say tweeter we'll call three sub uh, four just be nothing yep and then five and six could be f mid sure now we have to go over to the output view yep and so when we go over to our output view, this is where the majority of your, um, you know, the majority of where your uh, tweaks and things are going to happen. This is where most of what you're gonna do with your tuning and setup and all that good stuff is gonna happen. And that's, I, I mentioned the word tuning and that's something that kind of drives me crazy a little bit with DSP and stuff like that is everybody has this idea that they need a DSP so that they can do tuning. But really it's like 95% about just setting it up. You know what I mean? Like if they never did any tuning at all, if all they did was set levels, do summing, you know, and do everything else like it, which is the basic of the, the basis of this class absolutely. is to kind of work your way through these parts of a DSP. Yeah. And you can either, you know, the the point of this is you can use as much of the DSP right. or as little of the DSP as you need to achieve your goal. Yeah. 
Um, and output view is gonna get us to the point to now where if we have to do summing. Absolutely, and so one of the things that I do when I'm in output view is I always name my outputs. Oh, 100%. Just like I always name my inputs. So um, you're, you're the one configuring this system here, Dean. So what are we gonna call our outputs? Uh, one, two, we wanna do is tweeters. We'll do that, tweeters. Okay. And then we'll call three and four mid. All right, so let's do mids. We'll call five and six rear. Perfect. And then seven could be sub. Okay. And then we'll use eight unused. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just call it unused. Cool. So we've got our configuration there. You saw how easy it was to go through and name those. Um, it takes two seconds, but it makes all the sense in the world to just take the two minutes and name or two yeah. seconds and name it's, them. It's a great little silly feature. I, I can't believe how many people that all log into their DSP and, and nothing is named. Yeah. You have and you no go, idea. well, wait, which input is which and which output is which? Oh, I don't remember. And you're like, okay, well. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to help when nothing is named. <laughs> so one of the main things here, guys, is, is when you're looking at our software in particular is this section that says output summing. And the way it's named is interesting, but it's, it's really what we should just call maybe summing or something along those lines, or input summing maybe. Because the way I think of this is, where do I want my signal to come from for the selected output channels, how I look at it. So when I'm looking at this and I say my output, we're on, output 1-2, which is our tweeters, you know, where do we want that signal to come from? So in this case, my input 1-2, if you recall, was also a factory tweeter signal. So great, I have 1-2 highlighted, which means my output channels 1-2 are gonna be fed by input channels 1-2. Awesome. Which is our tweeter for tweeter. Exactly, so that should work just fine. Now if I go over to output 3-4 and I need my, uh, these are going to be my outputs for my mid-range or mid-base drivers. Again, I need to make sure that for outputs 3-4, I have enough input to feed those channels and make them sound the way I want. So if we look at our inputs here, 5-6 was my inputs that have mid-base on them. So I want to make sure that for that output channel 3-4, I have at least 5-6 lit up. And if I wanted to do some sort of summing there, this is where I would do it. Now, in some cases, there are some vehicles where if you have a high frequency mid-range in the dash, mm -hmm. it is going to be crossed over at a much lower frequency. And that means that the mid base in the door is going to be crossed over at that same low frequency, yep. which if now you're putting the tweeter in the dash, the mid-range might not be playing the amount of signal required to have it couple. Mm -hmm. So summing in the tweeter to that mid-base is something you would want to do for those two channels. Absolutely. So in that case, if that's what we needed to do, all we're going to have to do is just light up or click on the channels we need. So if I click on 1-2, now I have 1, 2, and 5, 6 inputs summed together to feed outputs 3-4. So I think it makes sense once you see it kind of lit up and explained that way. Um, it, makes, it makes it a whole lot easier uh, once you understand that it's just, hey, where do you want your signal to come from, right? And and when we talk about, say, those rear speakers on my output, so let's click on 5.6, where do I want the output for that to come from? Now, in this system, maybe those are just coaxials. Maybe they're full range, so I need full or range for them. Or, right? or either way, yes. So yeah. Either you're going to want full range or just mid-range. Right. And so maybe, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe I just want to run them as like rear fill, so yeah. we just want mid. So I could just unclick this one, and now my input 5.6 is feeding my output 5.6. Now onto the subwoofer. In this case, again, I need a signal with some sort of base to send to that output number seven. Make sure there's enough base in that signal path to make that work. So in this one, my output number seven is gonna go to my subwoofer. Where's that signal gonna come from? Well, if you recall, input number three had all the signal we needed to drive that sub. So all we need to do is make sure that input three is lit up and now input three is driving output seven. So I should have everything that I need at that point to do what I need. Make it sound the way that I want. So the first core feature of every DSP or every amplifier with DSP built into it is going to be your input, whether it be LOC, line, line output conversion, or RCA, or whichever you're going to be doing, and then you have the ability to direct it to where you want it to go, which is a much bigger than just a basic high level to low level adapter. All right. Part 
Next. <laughs> Part next. Part next. <laughs> crossovers. You cannot do car audio without a crossover of some kind. There are many different types with varying results. Now let's talk about that because some of you out there are going, well, I put speakers in my car and I didn't have crossovers. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. If you buy a set of coaxials, the crossovers are built onto the speakers. If you yep. buy a set of components, it's gonna come with some form of passive crossover, either external or internal. Sometimes they're simple capacitors on the tweeters. Sometimes they're capacitors built on or into the tweeters. Sometimes it's a cap and coil attached to the mid-range. Yep. Uh, so there's always some form of crossover because not every speaker can play every sound. A tweeter is not made to play bass. A subwoofer is not made to play tweeter. Different types of crossovers, one of my favorite is, guess what frequency I am knob? <laughs> I feel we've all been using this and this is what a lot of them, a lot of us are accustomed to. Yep. Uh, there is a cool device out there, a crossover calibrator that allows you to narrow that down. Sure. There's nothing wrong with it, the frequency is there. It's just a matter of turning the dial until you get to it. The silk screen on the side is just close. <laughs> It's, it's like, ah, right around where I want it to be. Somewhere in between there. But that can be a big deal, especially if you're trying to be ultra precise, like on a tweeter. Yep. The difference between uh, 3200 and 2200 is a lot for a tweeter. And when you're looking at a dial style crossover, it's really easy to screw that up. Absolutely. Uh, who remembers these in the little bottom, the little Rockford chip crossovers? Oh, Remember yeah, those? I do actually. So it was a, it, it like you put it in one way, it's a low pass. You pull it out, you flip it over, and pray to God you don't static shock it. It's a high pass. Yep. Most of you are more familiar with what's in the middle there. You can only use the frequencies that they give you. That's from a radio. So a radio, mm -hmm. they do have decent crossovers, but you're stuck with whatever they give you. Um, for example, there again, like when you're using one of these that has network mode, it goes from like 2200 to 4000. That's not anywhere where I want to put my tweeter in most <laughs> cases. Uh, and then you really can only use these frequency dip switches. Hey, it's okay. You know, 80 hertz is where it's at. If you're good with that, flick this dip switch and you're golden. Uh, if you, so you 60, 80, or 120. If these don't work for you, you SOL. Yeah, tough. Tough, <laughs> tough. But at least it's something. Yeah, it's better than nothing, that's for sure. Every system needs a crossover. It is one of the most important parts, but we often settle for a very bad or basic version of one. Mm -hmm. DSP, however, opens up the world of variable precision crossover points. Accurately choose speaker crossover points. If that speaker needs 2300 hertz in order for it to work, pipe it in. Yep. It's there. Uh, if you want to cross over your mid range at 2523, <laughs> go for it. Whatever works for you. There is no guesswork. If you've typed it in, that's what it is. Uh, no extra tools needed. So there again, you've done the math, you figured out what it is, you type it in and, you, and you're done. No time wasted. There could be a lot of time spent trying to figure out crossover points on an amplifier or, uh, just, no, uh, no, you're just done, walk away. Yep, very, very simple. Very simple. Let's take a look at the crossovers inside of our processor. So when we look at the output side of the DM608 and our DM Smart DSP software, um, that is one of the first things that we're gonna see let me uh, maximize this to make this a little easier. So when we look at the actual crossover section, the nice thing is, is it's really, really simple within the software. It's basically, you can either type in the number you want or you can drag, drag and slide. slide a little slider. So let's say for these tweeters, our outputs one and two, we're gonna wanna cross those over pretty high most likely because they're a tweeter. So yeah, yeah chances are. So. Let's go ahead and uh, let's see here. What do we want to do? Maybe 3,500, something like that? Yeah, that'll work. Sure. Let's go 3,500 and up. So just by dragging that little slider, we've now got a tweeter that's playing from 3.5K up to 20K. And the nice thing about that is, is we've picked 35. If we decide to change it later, it's just type it in. Yeah, easy. And if you don't want to try to drag this and get to the number exactly that you're looking for, I can also click in this little box and type 3,500 and hit enter. 
and away we go. And it and automatically that. puts the period in the little K. It does. That's oh, so just nice. like that. And then we can also adjust our slope. So we either have, either have uh, 12 or 24 dB per octave crossover Linkwitz Riley on the top and bottom side of that. So we can adjust what that slope is. For those of you that don't know what that means, what is the slope? The slope is how steep do we want it to cut off after that number we're talking about. So once we're at 3,500, do we want it to be a gradual roll off? So it's still going to play a fair bit below 3500 or do we want it to be a real steep cutoff so it's playing very little below 3500 that's the easiest way to kind of think of that just basic layman's explanation right and the reason why we picked the linkwix <coughs> riley is especially 24 is so that if there's any uh, dip in the crossover point or any phase shift or anything like that the 24 db linkwix riley will solve that so if you're going to be doing point for point crossovers meaning 35 up and then 35 down you want to use the 24 db for sure right, right. yeah otherwise you end up with a bump in your response and all a bump that or stuff. a dip and yeah either way so so oh. right off the uh <laughs> right off the top talking about just Ooh. crossover oh. Oh. oh my god dude. you're so goofy <laughs> so uh we did tweeter for crossover or excuse me crossover for tweeter channels let's take a look at our output 34 which is for our mid-range so Remember, we crossed the tweeter over at 3.5K. We've got it running from 3,500 and up. So our mid-range in that front door, I'm gonna say we're probably gonna run it down to maybe, oh, I don't know, what do you think, 80? 80 is always the good yeah. place to start. So again, like maybe I don't wanna sit here and mess with that and get it exactly. I can just type in 80, hit enter, and away we go. And then we'll bring the top side of this to 3.5 and there we are. So now we have a bandpass crossover and we are sending only 80 hertz to 3.5K or 3500 hertz to that mid range. Makes sense. And when we go to our rear speakers, it's kind of the same thing. Now we have a choice here to make depending on the system. Some people run them as uh, rear fill. Some people want them full range. Some people want them as uh, um, just full range, but high passed. You know, you've got some choices to make. Now earlier we said we were going to run them as just kind of a fill, just kind of mid only. So let's, uh, let's see here. Probably we'll do those at about the same, maybe 80 and up, something like that. Now, if they're not matching drivers, in some cases they aren't, the rear fill, like if you have a 6x9 in the front door and a 6.5 in the rear, I like to set my rears or start the rears off at 110. Sure. Uh, that way my main driver, the 6x9, can, can put out the mid base that it wants. Sure. And vice versa, if you have only 4s in the front doors and 6x9s in the rear, we can cross over those 6x9s a lot lower than we can a 4-inch speaker. And again, this is where having something like a DSP with crossover comes in handy versus just, hey, all my outputs are crossed over at 80 or whatever. So um, like on a lot of analog pieces. So let's let's go with that. Let's say we're gonna do uh, 110 instead just for some variety here. So now those speakers in the back doors of this vehicle, we've got 110 on up, but remember we're only sending a signal to that speaker that was mids only anyway. So we'll get 110 up to whatever that signal is. On our subwoofer side, the channel seven out, Again, pretty easy. This is just going to be a low pass crossover. I'm just going to set this as low as it'll go in this case down to 25. And then on the top side, I'm going to put this down at 80 is where I would probably normally set it. And now I've got a low pass crossover for that woofer. The woofer is going to play from 80 down as low as it'll go. If I want this to roll off a little uh, less steep on the bottom end. I could put this at 12 dB on the on the bottom side. If I want this to play up to 110 on the top side for whatever reason, I can do that too. It's really, really easy to make those changes. Now, that is also a bandpass crossover because what we're looking at, that 25 hertz, that is going to be our subsonic filter mm -hmm. for those. So, pick and choose the frequency you want for that. 25 is the lowest this it will do, yep. but if you'd like to go down to, or you'd like to go up to, should I say, 3200 or 3500, whatever works good for you is is pretty much where it's at. Yeah, and the reason it goes to 25 and not down to zero or something like that was just to provide a little bit of protection for, you know, uh, vented boxes and for most of the woofers out there. You know, we have guys all the time that'll email us or message us and say, well, I'm not getting anything below 25 then, and that's not 
the truth. No. Of course you're playing below 25. Yeah. It's just ever so slightly tapered off so that you don't blow up your woofers. Now one of the things we didn't mention so far in this is once you're setting up this particular processor, and most processors are going to have this, mm -hmm. uh, there's a save feature you're going to want to do. And on our uh, software, if you put two fingers onto your mouse pad or you just do right click over the number one there, which is what we're doing. Press it's and gonna hold. say, now here's the catch. You want it to say no and yes. If it says yes and no, you've done it wrong, start over. <laughs> so click yes, and what that's gonna do is that's gonna push that tune that you've done so far and bake it in the device. I recommend doing that at, after each one of these steps. So step one, the mm -hmm. LOC, save it. Step two, crossover, save it. The other thing you can do too is on the file management side, if you click the drop down arrow, save as. You can create a file that is going to store now to your desktop computer that you're using, whether it be Windows or Mac, it mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Um, if you're using Bluetooth and doing the iPad, you can do the same thing as well and save it to the iPad. Yep, it'll just save it to the within the app on the iPad, but yeah, perfect. Yep. And then if you, keep it open throughout the whole setup process it will add a save feature as opposed to the save it'll have save and save as once you've created the file every time you hit save it'll just rewrite it into that same folder if you quit the process and have to log back in just select save as find the file structure that you've done and then reload that in so you don't have to keep creating new files you can just write it onto the existing file that you've created yeah, it's very useful, you know, in case anything ever uh, catastrophically goes wrong. Oh, let's, yeah. Let's say your vehicle is involved Everyone in an accident or your DM608 unfortunately got stolen. Everyone has bad days. Uh, yeah, and you got to replace it. Well, now you don't want to spend an hour resetting up and tuning your new DM608. You could literally go into File Manager, hit Open, and just apply your tune. Yeah. Or if you're a it's, shop it's watching this wonderful. and you do a bunch of the same vehicle, once you've learned exactly what works great in that 2020 Silverado and you have your speakers and amp and sub that you kind of always do you know everybody kind of has that favorite system that they do no idea what you're talking about yeah, yeah right uh you know you can just reuse that tune if it's the same vehicle and the same gear it's a great at least baseline to start with to get you up and running so makes a lot of sense so that takes us to number two crossovers you gotta have them, guys. This is one of the easiest ways you could possibly ever do to set them up. But we're not done there. One of the funnest parts about a DSP has to be the equalization. Controlling the sound to improve our listening experience, it's nothing new, guys. It's nothing new. And what we're looking at here in this picture is one of the oldest forms of equalization, one of the EQLs. Uh, a version of this has been around for a very, very long time. Matthew happens to have maybe one right something here. like this here. Yeah, perhaps. yeah. They've been using it for a very long Imagine time. Imagine that. Imagine that. We also have up there one of my personal favorites, which is the Alpine, the BBE with the flashing lights. This thing was, uh, dude, back in the '90s, we used to put these things in just for the lights. <laughs> <laughs> because they were noisy. Uh, below that was my first personal EQ, which is oh, the yeah. single din, I'm half. sorry, half din, half din, yep. uh, Kenwood. And then the Old Faithful, the 73 EQ. Uh, this was like, it's always been a hundred bucks, guys. It's it's still a hundred bucks, I think. <laughs> you know, they've, they've had these forever. Uh, the newer version, of course, is in the top. And then if you were one of the few, the proud, the lucky oh, gooseneck EQ users, Wow. There was a lot of different wow. EQs that were, remember those though? And like, dude, that was, that was the bomb. If you dude. set yourself up a whole command center oh, with a gooseneck with an yes. EQ on it. Yeah. Now, or the gooseneck with the EQ next to the CD changer controller. There you go. Double yeah. goosenecks. There you go. Yeah. You're like a pilot at that point. In like an 80s uh, Regal or something. I can totally picture that. Uh, <laughs> we have been doing this for years with all these different devices. Trunk mount, noisy light shows, haftins, classic haftins, goosenecks, uh, and then, you know, tiny tinies. Currently, the most common equalizer is built into the aftermarket radio. A lot of those just disappeared because uh, it became easier to just build it into the radio. Uh, so what you're seeing here is the, the 
the direct result of that. Factory radios are not as lucky though, and that's what we're dealing with in a lot of the cases. In some cases, we have bass, mid, and treble. In other cases, we just have bass and treble. Yeah. Um, there's nothing new about equalization. It's done. It does not have to be crazy or overdone. And I feel that is one of the scariest parts. Yes. Is everyone assumes that there's 32 buttons, I have to touch all 32 buttons, which is not the case. Moving forward to the current equalization in a DSP. 30 bands of equalization in hours, or we have the option for 14 bands of equalization, or 10 bands of equalization. So we have basic, better, and advanced. Yep. You know, as crazy as you want to get. It's one of the really cool features that our DSP has that a lot of them don't. Yeah, because you don't always need 30 bands, right? I mean, not every install needs that. Not everybody knows how to tune that. And let's face it, not every channel or every system or every speaker needs 30 bands of EQ, right? I mean, it's just yeah. not something you always need. So it's nice to have options. Individual left and right equalization or grouped left and right equalization together. In some cases, you want to equalize left to right. In some cases, you just want to equalize in groups. So, for example, when you're doing tweeter mid front stage, always equalization in their own side, individual. You don't have to. It just depends what you're going for. Mm -hmm. But it has the option to do that. Whereas me personally in the rear, I just do that as a group. It's a rear. It's fill. I don't need to spend an hour back there worried yep. about whether if one tweeter is a dB louder than the tweeter on the other <laughs> side. Uh, draw an EQ curve. As you see in the example here, the standard smiley face curve, you can apply that, really simple, and see how it sounds. There again, it just depends what your end result is and what you're trying to do. You can also bypass the EQ for test checks. It's one thing that you run into where you're sitting there and you're playing with an EQ for 20 minutes or an hour and you're like, did I do anything? Right. Being able to just turn it off and turn it back on and go, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I did. Yep. Uh, just like its predecessor, the purpose is still to make good sound great. Uh, you can use as much or as little of the EQ to accomplish this. Now we're going to take a look at just that. Cool. So when we're looking at the output view side of things here, um, we can do a couple of different things. But, you know, as we go down and take a look, one of my favorite parts of our EQ and our software is that it overlays the RTA. Yes. That is so useful. And most people don't quite understand a lot of times what they're looking at there or they hear RTA and they just think of a microphone. You know, um, yeah. that's one of the biggest things is everybody thinks RTA and they go, oh, a microphone. I'm going to do an acoustic reading. It's like, no, 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 we're, we're nowhere near that point yet. Well, you know, that's, we're still setting things up at this point. And that's the funny part is that the RTA that this does, which is the electrical, right. is actually the more expensive version Absolutely. of the RTA. It's real, it's actually affordable to buy a microphone of some sure. kind or just use your phone with an RTA app. Yeah. But being able to look at the, the electrical signal coming over the system you got to have a device to do that. Yes. And this and is built in. Not only is it built in, but you have input RTA and output RTA. So, I mean, you really have both sides of it with the DSPs, which is really cool. So, I mean, we we're able to, if you recall, on the input side, see what we had coming in, see what that signal looked like. And now on the output side, now that we're getting to EQ, I can still see that RTA, but you'll notice that it looks different. It looks different because our RTA also reflects your changes in the software. So, so it's applied the crossover. Exactly. So we applied the crossover to our tweeter channels and now as you can see on there we only have high frequencies if i didn't see this if i still saw you know signal all the way across okay we forgot to do crossover or we're on the wrong channels it's or whatever so, for you. exactly it's a, it's a red flag for sure so one of the cool things you know you had mentioned a little bit on here dean is um you know being able to split these so um we get asked a lot too you know can i eq the front left channel separate from the front right Absolutely. And in ours, it's really simple. If it's one dash two together, these are now joined. If I click on just one, this is now going to be just channel one output or just channel two output. Um, now, my signal goes away there because I only have one RCA plugged in, but you get the idea. Yep. So I can do these separately. What's also nice is when I separate them up at the top of the output there, you'll notice I now have independent level outputs for left and right channels too. Which is really important with that mystery feature that we're going to talk about in the end because having independent level control 
really helps that one specific feature. Yeah. So with these, uh, let's say we're gonna, you know, EQ this, and just for uh, demo's sake here, let's join these back together and leave them that way just for simplicity. But one of the other cool things in the EQ section of this is, again, I mentioned that RTA is overlaid. Same feature, we're, we have the ability to have this as fast, medium or slow. So if you're dealing with a signal that is kind of sporadic and jumping all over the place, you can put it in S for slow, slow things down a little bit and make it a whole lot easier to read. Um, Dean had also mentioned the bypass feature, so you can do a quick A-B comparison. So if we do some awesome tuning in here and I bring these signals and make it sound super, super good like I'm doing right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can quickly and easily hit bypass and see exactly what it does to the signal and hear it, you know, if you're noticed, in the vehicle. You've noticed it's grayed out the EQ, it's no yep. longer white, so that's kind of telling you, obviously the big blue box is highlighted, but it's doing more, it does two things. Yeah, so look at the signal right now with no EQ applied, and then when we put the EQ back in, you can see what it's done to the signal really quickly and easily. So I go, ooh, I messed that up, I didn't want to do that, I can just hit flat and it will put this all back to factory for me too. So we have a quick, easy reset. You know, when we're talking about EQing and tuning a system and all those things, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there that even though they're not out to win IASCA World Finals, they'll spend three, four, five, six hours tuning a car, whether it's for them personally or they work at a shop and it's, you know, a car they're trying to get out the door. Uh, on a whole, just as a general statement, I think a lot of people spend too much time you know, they allow themselves to spend too much time wrapping up into that. I don't mm. think that the average vehicle needs five hours of tune time. You know, I think the average system can sound really, really good, you guys, in like an hour or so. I think you can get a lot done in an hour. Uh, you can get, you can definitely get a lot done in yeah, an hour. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as like we said, there's a 30 band is what we're looking at mm -hmm. here. We can also switch to say a 14 band or a 10 band EQ as well. And so I have a couple of different ways to manipulate this as well. If I wanna just click and drag on any one of these curves, or excuse me, any one of these points, I can easily do that. I can also use the arrow keys on here if I'd rather have physical keys. Um, if I was doing this with a tablet, of course, I could do it with my finger or a stylus or what have you. We also have a feature in here that's called draw. If I click draw, it allows me to either with a mouse, click and hold and drag, or if you were on a tablet, you could just drag your finger across as well. So let's put it back to 30 band and leave it on draw. I can click and hold and just kind of drag this wherever I want it to go. And now I've just created that curve. And you can see behind it, the RTA reflected that change that we just made. So pretty easy to use, pretty straightforward. Um, I'm gonna hit flat and put this back again. One other feature we didn't really mention when you were going through the slides, but is built into the audio control uh, pieces is our auto feature. Mm -hmm. Now auto is not to automatically tune your vehicle and make it you know, do everything that you want it to do and it's gonna sound amazing the second it's done. Come on, man. I know, <laughs> wild, right? But what it is there for is to help correct factory signal. So if you have an incoming signal that's got some dips, it's got some peaks and valleys, and we want to just try to get it to a good baseline to start with, just try to get it somewhat flat, right? Um, auto is really useful for that. So let's switch to a signal that has some full range going to it. So let's go to, oh, I think we did, let's go to 3-4. That's got, that's got some signal going in there. And just for a moment here, let's run the crossover full, just so we can see some more of it down there. Okay, so now we're running that output full range, right? And we can see that our signal here, we've got some deficiency on the low end. It's pretty well flat on the mid and high frequencies there, but everything below about five, 600 hertz is, you know, about high. what, six, nine dB down somewhere in there. So um, what we could do is with pink noise playing, that's the key, we need to hit auto and it's gonna tell you a few little pointers to make sure that you've done what you're supposed to do. And once you've made sure that you've got those things rolling, we hit yes, and it's gonna go through and analyze that incoming signal and try to correct it as best as it can. Now you can run auto several times. You don't have to just take the results the first time. But even after just this once, I'm gonna say yes, look at how much flatter and better that signal looks, right? Like it already went through and in a few seconds, more or less corrected that for us. If my signal looked like this to start, that system's gonna sound pretty good. Like I'm already a pretty happy guy at that yeah, point. Yeah, well you know? at that point, what you're going to get is 
you're gonna have cabin acoustics and whatever the characteristics of the speaker are are gonna be your direct result because now you're feeding them a signal that is is close to what I would call vanilla or basic mm -hmm. yeah. and just let them do their own thing. That's a great way to put it, yeah. Yeah, instead of flat, it's like, let's just start with a good baseline vanilla and then tweak from there, right? Yeah. Tweak for preference is kind of the way I usually put it. So, so if you were happy with this, great. Um, if you aren't sure what you're supposed to be doing down here, what am I shooting for? What am I trying to accomplish? You know, lots of guys will go through every one of these um, frequencies on a 30 band EQ, and they will sit there and drag each and every one up and down and see how it sounds. Yeah, which is not a bad way to it's learn. It's not. No, it's a great way to learn. Yes. But if you're watching this and you work at a shop and you're trying to get a car out the door, it's not exactly the most... You should, uh, you should have already spent some time doing that. You should. Your own. But, you know, it's not exactly the most uh, time-efficient way of doing things. No. So, um, one of the cool things in here is our RTA memories, um, which I know we're talking RTA, but this is uh, EQ stuff. But take a look at the RTA memories, and one of the cool things that's in here is the audio control house curve. The RTA memories allows you to save, think of it as a, a screenshot of the RTA response. So if you wanted to see this before and after, or you wanted to see what that signal looked like or what have you, you can just scroll down and say store and take a quick screenshot of this. But one of my favorite features is just having the audio control house curve. And if I click the house curve, you'll see in the background, it kind of ghosted a curve behind, and it's just giving you something to shoot for. If you aren't sure, what should sound good? Like, what What am I looking for here? Am I trying to get this flat? Am I trying to make it a big smile like everybody does when they're 13 on their home stereo? The boost the bass, curve, yeah, the, yeah, the JBL house curve, boost the bass, boost the treble. Um, this, this ghosted curve in the background is what we think sounds pretty good for most systems. And I've had lots of installers that are professionals at shops call me and say, you know, all I did was shoot for the house curve and that car sounded really good and the customer was happy. Like if you did nothing but shoot for house curve, I think a lot of these systems would sound pretty damn good. So yeah. it's a it's a quick baseline for those that, you know, don't have anything else well, to go well, on. Well, like I said, use as much of it or as little of it as you want Absolutely. in order to get the results that you're going for. Yeah. Yeah. And if your signal was truly flat to begin with, maybe you don't need a lot of EQ and that's totally okay. Yeah. But you're probably going to need it to compensate for, you know, like you said, the acoustics of the vehicle, the characteristics of the speaker, all those sorts of things. So there's a lot that we can do with that. Or we can tone it down to just a 10 band EQ and start real basic if we need to. And there, that, there again is one of the really cool features about our product is that you can have the simplicity that you need to get comfortable with the product and it can grow with your ability to learn and, and evolve into a master tuner if you like mm -hmm. or just to get in there enjoy it and move on yeah you know the ultimate goal is volume up volume down <laughs> i mean right. at the end of yeah. the day that's that's what i, I tell my customers yes. they're like what well, i what do i need to do volume up volume down yes that's it that's all i want you doing i, I tell guys all the time if you have to tweak EQ or DSP for every song, something's wrong. You shouldn't have to do that. You know, there's drugs for that. Right. <laughs> there's, there's drugs. There's drugs to fix. But you that. know, it's funny because guys will mention like, oh, so the presets. I can make a preset for rock and one for hip hop and one for this. And it's like, well, if it's EQ'd properly, you really shouldn't have to do that. No. And there again, all you should need you, is a bass knob and a volume knob, if, basically. If you have a factory EQ or a factory radio with bass, mid, and treble sure. control, that's a global EQ. Absolutely. So if you're listening to something that has too much treble. You could go on your factory radio mm -hmm. and turn it down two clicks. If you go into something that has no treble, you can go into your factory radio and turn it up two clicks. That's a great point because we get asked that a lot yeah. too. It's like, well, should I still use the EQ in my factory stereo if I have a DSP? And the answer is maybe sometimes. Yeah. But I would start with that factory radio oh, at flat, flat. Flat. Put everything at zero. Right. Balance. Uh, fader, bass, mid, treble, whatever your factory radio Flat. has, then do your DSP work, and then like Dean said, you've got that as a global EQ for the later. The other nice thing too is that if you find yourself having to do something with that, like if you get in there and you're like, I'm always turning the mid-range at negative sure. two, that means that really what you need to do is put it back to zero, go back into the, the EQ. In the adjust, DSP. Yeah, yeah. And, and adjust it accordingly so that that can stay at zero. Yeah. But there again, if you're happy with your end result, remember, don't lose any sleep over this. Just keep it the way it is and move on. Volume sure. up, volume down. And that takes us to the third function of the DSP, the EQ. How cool is that? We have one more feature left that I personally feel, well, you know, let's just head over to the slide <laughs> and we'll don't want to rob you of the cool text. 
Lastly, we have the feature that I feel really defines the DSP. Time alignment. The goal of this feature is to bring a more home-like stereo sound into your car. As the visual here shows, you have a right speaker, you have a left speaker, and you have your instruments around you. Yes, we're playing a record. <laughs> Listeners are equal distance from both, I'm sorry, the listener is equal distance from both speakers. Typically, if you have a, whether it's a bookshelf speaker or a home theater, the spot is in the middle, man. Yep. This will give you the illusion of the instruments and the singer's placement. So if there's a drummer off to the left and a guitarist off to the right, and a keyboard, wherever he's at, drummer would be behind the singer, I know. Anyways, if they're <laughs> wherever they're at, you should be able to kind of get that sense if it's a good recording and it's a good playback. Yep. Well, we don't have that in a car. And the reason for that is the solar system of sound. This is a representation of what that was. We're the, we're the center of our solar system, we're the sun. And our speakers are equal distance around from us. However, when we hop into a car, the solar system looks like a car. Where we're sitting in the driver's seat, this speaker is a couple inches away from us, the tweeters maybe a little bit further, the door panel on the passenger side most of the time is the furthest speaker from us until you add a subwoofer. The tweeters, there again, it could be the farthest thing, the yeah. rear and whatnot. So we need to push these locations all out to one. We have to get our solar system of sound in check, just like we did for our home. We need it to look like this, but in order to do this, we will, oh, this will need help giving the illusion of balanced stereo sound. How do we do that? Measure from the center point of each speaker. What I mean by the center point is like the dust cap. Okay. Like the middle of the speaker, physically. Yeah, physically, yeah. The, yeah. the middle of the speaker. Yeah. So if it's it has nothing to do with specs or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're talking physical here, guys. Make sure to add in space for the grill of the uh, the grill to the speaker distance. So when I'm talking middle of speaker, the dust cap, and you have a grill that's two inches away from it, make sure you add in that two inches. So if it's 39 inches to the grill, it should be 41 inches to the actual point you're trying to measure. The only time that doesn't matter is if all speakers are two inches away from the grill, well then it's not that important because you'll be shorting each one of them the two same inches amount. and it's the same distance in the end, it'll be the same delay. Yeah. Uh, when, use a pa when using passive speaker systems, measure to the mid base, go to the bigger driver. If you're doing a three-way set, whether you're doing a, a two-way set, I will always have Fernando measure the tweeter, the mid-range, the mid-bass, the tweeter, the mid-bass, whatever it is, because I want all those numbers. I'm going to start with my mid-bass as my main distance. However, sometimes, depending on where that mid-range plays and the crossover points of it, I will swap those two out sure. to get the better center image. Uh, most DSPs will do calculations for you. However, not all DSPs will. Our DSP will do the calculations. So if you type in all your inches, it will do the math in order to give you the appropriate delays. So for example, we put some numbers on here. 37, 35, 39, 56, 56, 58, and 56. So again, these were just random numbers that we picked from a car that we had done. When we add all these numbers into our DSP, it is going to calculate a delay that is going to allow that solar system of sound to push those speakers out as a matter of speaking. It's not really doing that. It's just holding and releasing. So let's take a look at the laptop and we'll show you how to enter these numbers. So this is one of those things too where I feel like with a lot of this, um, you know, I feel like time correction, time alignment, delay, signal delay, whatever it is that you want to call it, yes. is probably the number one thing that doesn't get used on either you know, a, a, a separate DSP like we're talking here, a DSP amplifier, um, the, the settings in a doubled in head unit. I feel like it's the setting that 
ninety percent of the people out there never touch and never use. And it's one of the it, easiest ones to do. It's one of the easiest to do, and it could arguably make one of the biggest differences. Like oh, an overall sure. listing experience and enjoyment in that system. I really feel like the for me, the first time I heard a car that had any sort of time correction, and it was one of my own cars, and it was just a two-channel system, right? Passive crossovers, nothing special. But when I applied time correction, holy cow! Like what a what a eye-opening huge difference that makes and you and it, it's like a light bulb goes off you go oh i get it like i get it now you know what i mean well, because and, the sound goes from this yes. speaker on especially if you have a wide car like you have a right. pickup truck it's like right. all the sound is coming from that corner of yeah, the you car. mostly hear that speaker in and, that corner and you never hear this one right and so all of a sudden when you add time it just brings the sound up to on the dash to whatever point you've decided is your center point. Yeah, when I used to demo it for customers, you know, in the car I'm talking about, a lot of the customers would go, oh, you turned on a center speaker. Because, yeah. I mean, it virtually sounds like there's a center speaker coming from the middle of the dash. It's such a it's such a, a cool, powerful thing to, like, A, B comparison for someone, you know? So let's take a look at how to do that, though, in the DM Smart DSP software. And it is stupidly easy i mean it couldn't be easier really um when we take a look at this again we're in our output view we click on the outputs that we're looking at in this case let's talk tweeters first so outputs one two this is an active system so we're gonna do the mids and tweeters separately like dean mentioned if we were using passive crossovers we would do it you know from the larger driver so in this case let's talk tweeters um 37 and 56 37 i just typed in 37 and go over here, 56, and away we go. So it just added those delays for me. The front mid ranges. 35 and 56. Okay. I know what you're thinking. Oh wait, the tweeter and the mid range are the same distance. That happens a lot, sure, believe it or absolutely. not. absolutely. Well, especially, you know, you can still time correct coaxials. You know, sometimes they're almost in the exact same spot. You can still do that. Yeah. 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 So it, this doesn't only apply to component speakers. It doesn't only apply to active systems. It could literally be a simple, you know, radio and two coaxes and an amp and sub. I mean, you could still time correct that and still have a huge difference from it. So, um, so let's look at the rears. Uh, 39 and 58. All right. And 58. And then our sub. 56. Perfect. So just by doing those settings right there, if we were sitting in the car right now, we would basically hear the difference between it sounding like your ears can localize each speaker. Cause that's the way I think of it is when I'm in that driver's seat, even if I close my eyes, you know, I, I can't really picture the artist here and the guitar there and the drums here and this and that. All I can really hear is my brain going, there's a speaker there, there's a speaker over there, there's a speaker back there, this and that. Once you kick in that time correction and it's done correctly, it, suddenly it's like, oh, the artist is in the middle of the stage, the drummer is right there but to the left, and the guitar is over there, and I mean, it really... Oh, yeah. Uh, it really opens everything up, and just what a world of difference. Now, Dean also mentioned earlier that if you're talking our software, which of course we are, um, you'll want to save after each of these steps, Correct. which is really easy to do. So, again, I'm just going to click and hold on preset number one, and I'm going to... Hit yes, and I just saved everything that we've done. Um, if we were in the way there, again, the presets are up here in the top right corner, and all I'm doing is clicking and holding on that one to overwrite, and hit yes, and I just saved everything we've done so far to preset number one. Now, what I normally do when I'm doing the, the DM Smart stuff is after I get my, you know, um, EQ, my input levels, my signal summing done, my crossover set, I'll usually go through and save it to all four presets just so that they all have like a baseline on them. Yeah. Now, if you're somebody that's going to use different presets and you're going to do a single seat tune and you're going to do a no time correction on preset two or whatever, okay, great. That's how you're going to do it. If you're going to have different presets for different inputs, maybe you're going to use the Bluetooth adapter with this and you want to have, you know, an, uh, preset set up for that. The presets are going are how you're going to set that up and save that so that you can switch between them and that sort of thing. But the presets are really easy to use. It's just a matter of click and hold. Now, one more thing with time alignment that we kind of alluded to when we were talking about the EQ and we were talking about channel one, channel two, switching it to two channel equalization mm -hmm. mode. If we go back to that, one thing you have to remember about time delay is if my head is here and my speaker is there, it is never going to be a different distance. 
it's fixed. I'm here, it's there. If the time delay isn't exactly where I want it, I don't touch the delay. I Meaning it's already, it's already, it can only only be 56 inches away. Right. It's never going to be anything else other than that. Yeah. Don't start adding and subtracting inches trying no. to tweak it. But what you are going to do is adjust the level control mm -hmm. because sometimes it's just a matter of how it was EQ'd. If they both match, well, that means that they're both going to be playing at the same level. And in some cases, the time alignment isn't going to be enough to offset that. Yeah. So even though it's trying to, this is too much sound coming from it. Now we can go back over to the uh, summing, I'm sorry, the output summing where yep. we see the mute and level add. And, oh, I'm sorry, odd and even. <laughs> uh, sorry, distance, can't see. And we can turn down those channels. So yep. if it's pulling too far to the driver's side, I can start to reduce the level on the driver's side. If it's pulling too far to the passenger side, I can reduce the level on the passenger side. And I can do this for all those channels that are mm -hmm. set up like that. That's a tip that a lot of people, they don't know what to do with it. It's like, it's not where I want it to. Yep. Just grab the level and start turning it down. And usually what most guys do is they figure, well, I must have mismeasured something. And you'll see them remeasure the same yeah. car five times. And they're like, well, I keep getting pretty much the same measurements, you know? And, yeah. and people are very concerned with, well, do I measure to the middle of the headrest? Do I measure to, you know, to here, to there? And it's like, you're going to get pretty much the same yeah. measurement, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there again, it's a, it's a subtractive measurement. So right. at the end of the day, it's always going to be the same amount of inches when it's yeah. done. Yeah. Uh, you just need to adjust your level control at that point. Now, one tip on that too, though, is to remember if you've been like, you know, moving the seat around, you put the amp under the seat or the DSP under the driver's seat, you're going to want to probably put that seat back to your driving position because um, that does definitely make a difference. Well, before we start on every car, one of Fernando's jobs is to Take the immediately measure yep. the seat and where it was because we are putting the amp underneath the seat sure nine times out of ten yep so we measure that seat and don't measure the steering wheel whatever you do because the steering wheel could get it can move sure so always pick a fixed point we like to pick the knee buster in the dash that first little rollover point where the steering wheel attaches to yep. the dash and we'll go to the crack in the seat most seats have some form of a stitch line in them sure those are great points in which to measure to both from the headliner down and from the dash forward yeah that way you can when you're done put that seat back exactly where it needs to go and rock on because most of the time people aren't adjusting their seats sure and if it's if it's your own personal mm -hmm. car just make sure when you're done you know hit memory one again or whatever and put the seat back where it's supposed to go Ooh, listen or, to you with that fancy or... memory one <laughs> wow oh, come on every car has memory seats these days don't they no oh. no they don't oh, okay well excuse me for being bougie i guess <laughs> <laughs> Boom! The scary box is no more. Thank you. That's, that's right, guys. That's that's it. That's, all there is to it. That's demystifying the black box in a nutshell. Break it down to its core pieces, which are line level adjustment or LOC. Yeah. Crossover, equalization, and that oh-so-scary time alignment. Yep. And what you have is just a really cool box with all of the same things that we've been playing with in Car Audio for years and years and years, with the exception of time alignment. Yep. And boom, we, we, have, we have it. We're done. Yeah. I got nothing. I mean, it's basically all the things, like Dean said, we've been you know, playing with forever. And I love it when I see this stack of product from a car from 10 years ago or whatever, and it's got a line driver and an LOC and a crossover and an EQ and some sort of, you know, maybe not time correction, but some sort of spatial box or something like that. And you go, wow, all of that now fits into this one little yes. black box Thank and God. takes half the time and a quarter of the cost and away you go and you have better sounding cars. So it's a big That's what it's all about. Yep, absolutely.